Pine Talk, episode 11, has some neat facts I don't mind telling, a treat I've outlined in this poem. We heard a bird, chirp chirped a word, slurped and burped a verb, KDE has a superb new patron, right on the new release, they won't cease creating great things piece by piece with Pine64 helping with the price tag, man, I've got this in the bag. I probably shouldn't brag, but dag, I amaze and astonish. Whoops, to be honest, I stole that from the hottest musical on Broadway. Okay, anyway, the bird was a blue jay on its way to the Linux Lounge Cafe. I am Peter, your Linux phone procrastinator. And I am Ezra, content creator who's releasing a game. And now, welcome to the 11th episode of Pine Talk, the podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. In this episode, we'll be discussing the June community update and some of your feedback and questions. Also, we're having another interview. But first, what have we been up to lately, Ezra? I'm releasing a game. Yay! <laughs> Yay! It's nearly done. It should be released June 22nd if no serious issues arise. Otherwise, shortly after. The game is, of course, completely open source, so you can make fun of my horrible, horrifying code. It's a mysterious adventure filled with a handful of mini games, a short story, and minimal moon logic. It's a point and click game. It's called Televoid Out of the Loop. And it's a fan game for a show I enjoy, Televoid, an online series starring Ian McLeod on his YouTube channel. To show our appreciation for this amazing series, some fans and I got together to make this game. Suggest watching the show and uh, and playing the game when it comes out. It's uh, pretty much consumed my life these past few weeks, and honestly, oh so longer. But since it's close to release, it's been taking a lot of my time. Uh, and after the release, I might have some fun and see if I can't port it to the Pine phone for the giggles. Otherwise, I've been back on the video making train, making videos on YouTube and Odyssey, and uh, making videos about various Pine64 products and game development quite soon, if not already, depending on how I feel. <laughs> I quite enjoyed your video about the Pine Cube. Yeah, it had a little more effort put into it. Yeah, it was quite nice, and there aren't many videos about this product, so I think Yeah, it's... if you search Pine Cube, you're sure to find my video. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite it's it's it, it is quite a deserted area. It needs it needs some love, man. It needs you some love. even modded Minecraft for this. Yeah, I modded Minecraft just for that video, just to to make a joke. And it was worth it. I'm really happy with how the video turned out. And you should look at it on my YouTube or Odyssey. Odyssey is a good place to look at it. And also check out my game. There'll be All of these links will be in the show notes. What about you, Peter? What have you been up to? Oh, I've been just barely keeping up with things. I wrote a blog post on June 9th because I've had my Pine phone for a year at that point. Mm -hmm but I didn't manage to make a single new video since the last recording. So if you want to, feel free to give my Glorroid video another view. It's not doing so well. No. But, I mean, who cares about those numbers? So, <laughs> at least I will have written the 50th installment of Linbits, my weekly update on all things Linux Phone, by the time this episode is out. So that train is also still going, and 50 feels like a major milestone. Oh, for sure, for sure. Half of a hundred. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, frightening a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get on with it now and start with the app of the episode. So my pick for this episode of all these 286 apps that are listed on landmobapps.framer.io right now is Spot, a GTK ROS client for Spotify Premium. It works just fine except for Spotify's podcasts, 
but depending on your point of view, that might be even a feature, right? <laughs> so some may ask, why doesn't it support the free tier? There are three letters I have as answer for that. API. There just isn't a good API, or if any, for the free tier. So if you want that, go the Enrock server. Uh, just try the app. Or if you dislike Spotify, there are many reasons to do so, right? Uh, go mm -hmm. with another app to play with your local or remote music. But I think for a Spotify client, it's definitely really nice and you should try it. Awesome. And now it's time to relax in the Linux lounge with our friend, Kyle Bourne. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm pretty good. So we prepared a few questions. Some of them have been sent to you to uh, prepare and we'll get through them and uh, learn about you so who are you uh well i'm linux lounge i create content mostly videos about linux and really any other tech that i feel like usually leaning to more towards free software that's very interesting how did you get started with free software computing and linux honestly it's like it's pretty hard to say for certain because tech has kind of always been a part of my life so I can't really pin down exactly when I got into tech or Linux. I'd have to say that, like I said, I've really always been into tech. Uh, but when it comes to Linux, like most kids who were really into tech, I wanted to just tweak and customize everything. And at the time, I was actually really into jailbreaking Apple devices. So I actually got into Linux through that because I wanted something similar on my laptop at the time. Hmm. That's very interesting. Of course, I wouldn't use those Apple devices now, but like at the time, it was cool. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember which uh, device exactly? It would have been, I think, the first device I ever jailbroke was an iPod Touch 2G. Um, although I wasn't doing that sort of thing that far back, I just happened to get one used. Right, right. What did you do once you jailbroke? Installed pretty much all the tweaks I could find, and it, it ran absolutely awfully. But it was the coolest thing ever. And sounds like uh, sounds like freedom to me. Well, I mean, it was proprietary software, but like as free as you can get on an Apple device. Free as you can get. <laughs> Given that you've, or in fact, yeah, well, you know, Apple devices are pretty closed, so. What about some open devices like Pine 64s, open devices, the Pine phone? When did you first hear about that and, and, and get interested? Um, to be honest, that one is pretty difficult to answer as well. Um, Linux phones have kind of always been on my radar. I've <clears> pretty much been following them since when Canonical was still developing Ubuntu Touch. I think I used to read about it in Linux magazines and stuff. So it kind of only seems logical to me that the Pine phone would enter my radar and be something that I'd be quite interested in. <laughs> mm -hmm. And from there, the other Pine devices, I suppose, just kind of dominoed into your vision? Yeah, I think like a lot of people, the um, the Pine phone was pretty much the first, well, the first time I'd heard of Pine 64. Mm -hmm. uh, although ironically, um, at the moment, I, I don't use the Pine phone, but I use my other Pine 64 devices all the time. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you've got multiple Pine 64 devices. Out of all the ones you have, uh, which one's your favorite? Honestly, like probably the Pine Book Pro. The Pine Book Pro. Why? Um. Well, I consider myself to be someone who, like, I know probably everyone is like this, but I like something that's quite premium. So the Pinebook Pro for $200 or $220 at this point gets you a device that's made out of aluminium, performs reasonably well, has a 1080p screen, has all these nice modern features like USB-C and stuff, and still performs pretty well. So for me, that's like the ideal laptop. Also, it runs Linux, so... Well, you heard it here. <laughs> the Pine Book Pro is quite an interesting laptop indeed. I I don't have one, but I would I would like to to try it out and you definitely convinced me, so. Oh, I guess uh, I guess you'll have to put me in contact with the Pine 64 marketing guys then. Yeah, yeah, I'll make sure to pass your name. <laughs> I right, good. 
So you're a content creator. You make videos on uh, YouTube and Odyssey. I heard that you like to refer to yourself as an Odysseer. Uh, sometimes. What is your workflow for making videos and blog posts and whatnot? Um, well, I do actually have a video about how I make my videos on my channel. Uh, but the short version of that is I tend to come up with the idea, which usually it'll just kind of occur to me and I'll write it down like as a note. And then from there, I tend to write my script in LibreOffice, then record that script in Audacity, edit it in Caden Live, create a thumbnail in Krita. If I need any screen recordings, which most often I'll do, I will use Simple Screen Recorder. And it's worth pointing out that I could actually easily do this on Pine64 devices, and actually in the past I have. Hmm, interesting. Can I, uh, if I may ask, um, what the... Why did you choose Simple Screen Recorder over something like uh, OBS? And honestly, because it just kind of works and it's a click and go solution, whereas with OBS, it's a little bit more set up to it, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But to be honest, either or works and OBS is definitely more powerful. So I think if you weren't used to using Simple Screen Recorder, I would probably recommend OBS. All right, all right. So yeah, uh, you mentioned a bit of your workflow. Uh, uh, you make your videos in, in Caden Live. When editing, what goes through your mind? Um, to be honest, uh, not a lot. I don't really have any kind of um, particular ideas that kind of go through my mind. I just want to go. Th- it's hard to explain the process, really, to be honest, but I kind of just um, do what occurs mm-hmm. to me. Whatever ideas and inspirations come your way? Pretty much. Um, I have found with like experience, some things work and some things don't, so I kind of do have a bit of a process, almost. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's probably not the best practice, but uh, a lot of the time I do kind of work as I go along mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. If ever you you get blocked, where what do you do? Where do you go to to get more ideas or inspiration? Um, to be honest, I think uh, with me, inspiration is kind of either there or it isn't. So you might have noticed that the upload rate on my channel has slowed down recently. That's kind of because I've been taking a little mm-hmm. bit of a break from it. But now I find that like ideas are starting to come to me again. So it's kind of. If I'm not generating ideas, then usually a break will sort right. that out. And, and now recently, uh, you, you've been making a few videos and posts about uh, the Windows Phone? Yeah, I, I guess you're going to expose me for having used a Windows Phone. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I know. Blasphemy. What I will say is it's um, they definitely did have kind of the right idea, and it's vastly, vastly, vastly better than Windows on the desktop, I think. Hmm, that's very interesting. Uh, pursuing that that branch of thought, uh, which other, if any, ideas of this now dead platform should um, mobile Linux perhaps inspire from? Well, to be perfectly honest, most of what I like about the Windows Phone is already <laughs> available in mobile Linux. It's highly polished, lightweight, far more so than Android. That said, though, I would definitely like to see some mm-hmm. sort of Linux desktop with live tiles. Interesting. It was a pretty cool feature, I think. Yeah, especially, like, it, it, it's... I, I often find it quite interesting to, to think about how they had that idea hmm, such a, a long time ago. Yeah, that's true. The more you know, it's pretty interesting. I, I imagine that a lot of people who have only used desktop windows are probably um, <laughs> going to say, like, well, what are you talking about? Why would you mm-hmm. want to use live tiles? But yeah. now on the Windows phone, they are pretty handy. Like, just being able to open your phone up to the home screen, then look at the news from that, it's it's useful. Mm-hmm. Just, just, just glance and you're done. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, I agree. It, 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 it does sound quite useful and... and I think there's a lot of things, you know, what's intuitive for a small mobile screen won't be intuitive for a, a large desktop multi-monitor <laughs> setup. Yeah, I, I think when designing desktop operating systems, pretty much all the major big name operating systems, Mac OS, Windows, have kind of forgotten that, yeah, what works <laughs> on a phone 
does not necessarily work on a desktop. Mm-hmm. Although saying that, though, I do quite like GNOME, so maybe I'm just like completely full of it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I do like how how GNOME managed to do swiping features, not just with like a touchscreen, but with um, the uh, yeah, it's kind of yeah, both. It, it's a good, uh, it's a balancing act, but uh, you need to experiment, I suppose. But uh, not at the expense of uh, something like Windows 8, I suppose. Yeah, even Windows 10 is kind of (laughs) a bit iffy. So, uh, tell me, what does an average day look like in the life of Linux Lounge? Well, I suppose this is the part where I'd like to say, yeah, I'm always grinding on videos and just... No, um... Honestly, surprisingly, given the fact that I'm kind of the, the archetypical introvert usually i am actually usually out doing something outside the house though Mm. Uh, that said though i do like sitting down messing with linux playing video games watching movies all on linux of course Uh, i also recently got a vr headset so as you can imagine i'm off in another world a lot of the time Mm -hmm, at the moment mm -hmm. too and and what do you do when you're out out and about uh well i mean i guess uh the usual out and about stuff taking a walk in the park Eh, usually something like that. Sounds nice. I'm also, like, relatively social with people, I'd like to mm-hmm. think. Mm-hmm. Although, uh, that said, though, taking a walk in the park and uh, listening to, like, a Linux podcast or something, that's that's where it's at. Yeah. If people want to follow your work, how can they best do that? Well, my largest audience, by far, is definitely on YouTube over on my channel, which is uh, Linux Lounge. However, I think that a lot of people listening to this show probably share my sentiments about YouTube. Um, so if you don't want to use YouTube, you can find me over on Odyssey and two separate PeerTube instances. I also pair at post rather a fair amount over on my Mastodon account, which is Linux Lounge at Fosterdon.org, mm-hmm. which I suppose in terms of keeping up with the channel is kind of like the hub to do it. Oh, awesome. Do you have any parting words, any videos you're working on that you'd like to announce? Any ideas? Uh, not off the top of my head, no, other than saying it's been a uh, pleasure to be on the show. Well, we we're really happy to have you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks again to the Linux Lounge for coming on. We, s- we will have all of the important links in the show notes. But now let's continue with the community news where this time we'll only go through the Pine64 June community update, subtitled New Hardware, and more on the way. How mysterious. As always, it starts with a housekeeping segment that Peter will will talk to us about. Exactly. Pine64 have created some new helpful pages for buyers or prospective buyers and new users. An availability tracker, which is necessary, I think, to reduce their support volume in terms of, well, is this available and how long will it be available? Mm -hmm. And then a getting started page, uh, which lists, for example, software projects you might try on your newly purchased Pine64 product or also the status of software. So the Pine phone, uh, rightfully so, is marked as not quite super ready. Mm. Um, yeah. Some have a hard time understanding that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that uh, may happen here and there. Uh, and then also in the housekeeping section is a word on being nice. Um, uh, <laughs> to be precise, chat etiquette and moderation. And I'll quote... I'll just read this out. As you know, a part of what makes Pine64 special is the direct involvement of developers from partner projects as well as community contributors in our chats and forums. Having developers from the different projects participate, work together and communicate with users is a major boon for us all. It is therefore alarming that in recent months we've seen an increase in non-constructive dissent. I don't wish to dwell on this, but long story short, it is one thing to voice an opinion and offer feedback, and another to ridicule 
or be hostile towards partner project developers just because you don't like a particular OS or UI doesn't make it hate worthy. After all, it is people's hard work and it's open software, so I'm sure there are other objects more deserving of contempt. Developers are people too, and they have their individual sensitivities. How you communicate matters, please keep that in mind. So these were all Lukas' words. These were all Lukas' words. He writes the most part of these updates in his role as Pine 64 Community Manager. And I can only uh, say to this, yes, take this seriously and just try to be kind. And not just to developers, but just try to be a good human being to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, don't think throwing negative opinions around or using hateful language makes you or anything any better it does not tone matters so i don't know ezra what do you think about this i think lucas said it pretty well is really well phrased that you know <laughs> we're a community and and the only way a community can can grow is through constructive criticism not yeah. not ridicule not hostility and you know i i always imagine a world where people help each other because you know they they want to help each other not because they they have to and i think the open source world is a, a small slice of that dream where everybody here is working many of them for completely free because it's a passion of theirs and they work hard to to bring joy into the world and uh, you know it's one thing to not accept or like what they're doing and it's another thing to just create negativity out of the thing that they created it bums everybody out precisely but with this out of the way let's get <laughs> to the exciting and more happy part of the news and the community update so most of that revolves around the Quartz 64 for me personally. So the Quartz 64 Model A is available today. Uh, you can buy it with 4 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM for US dollars 59.99 or with 8 gigabyte of such RAM for US dollars 79.99. Multiple optional SDL Wi-Fi models are in discussion. So as far as I understand this If you order it right now, it doesn't come with a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth chip yet, but that can be added later. Uh, the form factor is as known from the Pine A64 or the Rock Pro 64. And the Model B, which is more this classic Raspberry Pi-like form factor, is going to come later also but likely more than one Wi-Fi option. Now, there's also a new announcement around the Quartz 64 platform, if you will, and that is a So Quartz compute model featuring industry-standard 100-pin connectors. But first, let's turn down the excitement a bit. Uh, software support, which you can track on the Pine64 wiki, is still a work in progress. So if you follow the mainlining of other ARM systems on the chip, you'll know that this is taking a while. That's normal. Currently, display up output doesn't work, if I interpret that wiki page correctly. So this is not the single board computer that you want to get for the project. You want to be done with this month, right? For that, Pine64 has other options. But... Especially with that compute model, you know, which is, if you've been wondering what industry standard means, Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 compatible. And there have been a bunch of hardware designs supporting that uh, new form factor of module already. This is a really exciting product. And I'm really looking forward to it, especially because it's, I think, by now almost a well-established fact that this system on a chip is running pretty cool so it doesn't even really need passive cooling 
and that will enable a lot of things when it can be placed on little boards, larger carrier boards. You know, you could maybe build your own fun little com communication device or given that this uh, system on a chip supports e-ink screens, you know, the possibilities are endless. I'm just putting that out there. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. That looks really, really promising, yeah. I think would be the word. Definitely. Um, yeah, let's go over to the next product, and that's the Pine phone. On the hardware side, there's news regarding that keyboard accessory, right? Since last month's mm -hmm. update, both the first and second iteration of that keyboard prototypes have been sent out for internal testing and review. We've had Martin Brahm on and he told us his impressions in the last episode. So there's now a second revision, which has already arrived at Meggie's, whom you will know from his hard work on the Pine Phone kernel. And that has fixed the main mechanical issues on the spacebar and the enter key. And the battery in this hardware keyboard, which is quite huge and is going to be really useful to help with Pine Phone battery life, can now be detected by Linux even as a secondary battery, but dual inputs and ghost inputs are still a thing on this keyboard, hmm. and the feel of the keys apparently is inconsistent. So go read Maggie's blog, we'll link it, and also it seems likely I've heard that this keyboard accessory is likely going to ship with the open source firmware that Maggie is currently developing for this, so that's definitely cool, don't you think? Yeah, uh, that's, that's awesome. I do think, and it, it looks like uh, like Pine Six Zero has a solid start for uh, for their keyboard. It's not easy, but it looks like <laughs> they have a good path here, and I'm really looking forward to this accessory. Yeah, same. From stuff we can get shipped from China to stuff we can just download when it's ready. Uh, Plasma Mobile have published another monthly update and also released version 5.22 along with Plasma Desktop 5.22, which features some general improvements that are described in this monthly update by the Plasma Mobile team, while others will land in 5.23 in autumn or fall, however you call it, or maybe even winter. I didn't actually check that date. Uh, yeah, but anyway, there are new apps. One is Casts, uh, which we talked about and is my favorite Pinephone podcast client by now, even on Fosh. And Tokodon, a nice Mastodon client, which has seen its initial 2106 release as part of this now monthly Plasma Gear effort that most or all Plasma apps get a new release by. And then there have been, of course, notable improvements to existing apps, just to name two. Anglefish, the web browser, has now a web app manager as a central place to remove installed web apps. Because sometimes, you know, you've added something as a web app that you then don't no longer want, and it's good to have some overview and a good way to remove this. And then there's Congress, which is an event companion, maybe, right? Uh, which now offers mm -hmm. the schedule of Academy 2021, KDE's annual World Summit. By the way, that summit is also sponsored by Pine64, who are now patrons of the KDE project. Other software news were also in this update, and that is something that will make MMS users in the US and parts of Europe, because that's where this uh, fun protocol is still used. Quite happy, mm -hmm. or at least hopeful. And this part has been written by Chris, or you may maybe know him from his nickname, KOP316, who has been working on new version, the next generation of MMSD. And it looks like this effort is finally landing. So there are multiple components at play to then have easy MMS support in your distribution. But uh, his MMSD fork is now already being packaged in multiple distributions. And the work to programs like Chatty is also 
well, mostly done. So all that needs to happen now to have this easy and available for everyone is that it, things get merged, released, and packaged. Also, and I found that quite encouraging, uh, Chris encourages contributing to open source because this is his first actual contribution to the world of free software, and he found the community very welcoming. So, yeah. hey, that's good, right? Yeah, it's, it's very good. Outside of weird chat rooms or something, uh, the tone is still good. <laughs> that's making me really hopeful. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm sure there's many people, myself included, who, who are very interested in open source and who know how to program and who have never actually contributed to, to an open source project necessarily. And well, anyway, it makes me want to. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, uh, let's continue with the pine time as well, right? Yes. There was supposed to be uh, a new batch of pine times in the store this month, but a great component sort shortage of 2021 strikes again. The production is currently stopped due to the vendor being unable to provide the uh, acceleration sensor for the pine time. That's the thing that can counter steps and enable other features such as uh, wake on risk uh, rotation. The, the factory couldn't find uh, another source for this component. As such, an alternative option was given, replacing the BMA-421 with the BMA-425. <laughs> Although the new component is very similar to the old one, there is no certainty that Infinite Time can work properly with the replacement. An update uh, may need to be provided to support it if needed. This will unfortunately take a bit of time, but two units equipped with this new component have already been shipped for testing and should have arrived by the time you hear this. So that's some good news. What do you think? That definitely Peter? sounds like that might be an easy way to overcome this sudden hardship. But uh, mm -hmm. really, I mean, this component shortage is crazy and it's affecting, like, can affect every product and with the ships where you maybe wouldn't have guessed it, right? I mean, that's just yeah. a little component. Rather simple, it's I crazy. guess. Uh, and then it's not available. But mm -hmm. yeah. 2021, a year it's of pretty, wonders. <laughs> it's, oh, yes. Oh, yes. What wonderful wonders we have. <laughs> um, otherwise, Pine Dio. Pine64 is working hard to bring both in and outdoor Pine Dio LoRa gateways, uh, as well uh, as the various end nodes, to the Pine Store as soon as possible. Hooray for LoRa lovers! Yay! However, this may take a little longer than expected. Just as Pine64 were preparing to submit the gateway for certification, they learned that the Realtek uh, Gigabit PHY used on the Pine A64 LTS, uh, that is the brains of the Pine Dio gateway, can no longer be sourced. No. <laughs> if, if you're unaware of the ongoing global component shortage that we've now mentioned multiple times, uh, you're either not listening, skipped ahead, or in fact, where have you been on Earth? Because... Like, this is not your podcast about technology. You got to know about it. This is big. It's affecting everybody. <laughs> As a result of this, they introduced a new revision of the Pine A64 LTS version 2.0 with the same PHY used on Quartz 64 Model A. This was not uh, the only problem they found, however. Uh, the gateway also used the BL602 Wi-Fi Bluetooth chipset for which still needs a working driver for Linux. Mm. Because of these issues, Pine64 were unable to submit the gateway for certification, but they hope to do so in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, they've been working on their outdoor gateway, given how the, the outdoor gateway chassis uh, chassis are made out of aluminum. Uh, all the antenna signals, not only for LoRa, but also Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, need to be routed out side of the uh, the chassis 
while it may seem like a trivial task, it is not. Antenna placement is crucial on these kinds of devices, and Pine64 is working closely with an antenna vendor to offer an optimal layout within the constraints of the chassis. And uh, I know that, well, I can't wait to see how (laughs) how it's going to look, how the final configuration is going to be. Definitely. What about you, uh, Peter? That sounds. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm not really super into that lore stuff, but you're not one of the lore lovers. Uh I'm not a lore hater. That's for sure. No. But I'm not a lore lover. I'm guess I'm lore neutral. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm the Switzerland of lore. No. Yeah, this is these are those challenges we don't really hear about that often right that Mm -hmm. antenna design for cases made of aluminum is actually hard and that you need to get it right of course because otherwise it would be quite the useless gateway Mm -hmm. yeah these are challenges and then oh my god you know but that pine a64 lts (laughs) ah that component shortage Mm mm-hmm I'm so glad I don't work in hardware sourcing or design because I guess I would not sleep and pull my hair out. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a wonderful, wonderful world we live in. Yeah, well, maybe I would use a hammer and smash everything. <laughs> and smash all the components that are left. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of hammers... <laughs> the Pine Cell, the Pine Cell Hammerhead set is now available for purchase in the Pine Store. Whoop whoo! Yay! Uh, for those who are out of the loop, so to speak, the Hammerhead accessory provides a large surface area for desoldering surface mounted components. The set contains a special threaded tip allowing for securely mounting either a large 20 by 15 by 20 millimeter or a small 15 by 15 by 15 millimeter hammerhead. The hammerheads are made out of chromium coder pure blocks of copper and have excellent thermal conductivity, just like hammerhead sharks in real life. (laughs) Yeah, sure. (laughs) I don't think we've ever asked each other what we uh, thought about the hammerheads, so... uh, or at least I can't quite remember. The shots. I'm glad. I'm glad it's in in the in the store though. It's quite. It seems quite useful. Yeah, it's it's definitely quite interesting. So this is for everybody who would I think normally or well classically you would use hot air gun or a mm-hmm. special oven to do this soldering thing, and now they are just selling an accessory for. They're soldering iron to better desolder things, so that's quite fun and well in innovative even, right? So mm-hmm. I have to say I really find that interesting and I've got my pine cell here, which mm-hmm. I shame on me still really haven't used. But uh given that this is just twenty four ninety nine and it also comes with a silicon mat that mm-hmm. you can lie all this on so that your table doesn't burn <laughs> is ground because of all this heat the pines <laughs> can generate mm-hmm. um well you don't don't put it on your wooden table or something yeah. um this is quite interesting and i'm almost tempted to get this yeah yeah me too but i would really need a project to work on because otherwise i don't want to buy this and then it's just lying here and you guys can't get one right yeah. That would be yeah. shitty. Yeah. Let's buy all of the pine souls. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, is, is your pine soul the first uh, Risk Five computer you've ever owned? I think so. Unless I've got something else, maybe a hard drive where mm, Risk Five point. chip might be in, but I don't know of. Mm. But uh, as far as I know, it's the first and up to now still. Only risk five device I own, yeah. Hopefully that can change in the near future. Yeah, I hope so. So 
For more information on everything we just talked about, feel free to check out that June update on Pine64's blog. Uh, my section, I pretty much just read straight off of that post. And it's not plagiarism if I admit it. <laughs> also, uh, make sure if you have this time and want to make sure that we didn't miss something, watch mm -hmm. uh, the great video that Pizza Loving Nerd did once again. It definitely helps to... Uh, To, to absorb all that information when you can put it on and kind of like yeah absorb it definitely go watch it yes now now or well maybe after you finish watching a podcast because now we're moving on to community engagement exactly community <laughs> engagement you wouldn't want to miss out on that so we don't have any homework this time so we were uh clever and learned that uh well let's not give ourselves homework <laughs> but we have some listener feedback broad commented on tilvitz at last something about the pine cube joy looking forward to seeing future videos on this It could be especially cool to see it hooked up to Home Assistant. Also left the cheesy dramatics at the start of the video. Grown worthy, but entertaining. <laughs> well, don't I have a video for you? <laughs> yeah, you do. You know, now you only need to hook it up to Home Assistant if you have such a thing running. I mean, I could get uh, something like Mycroft if that counts as a Home Assistant. or uh, mm, I think Home Assistant is a specific software project. Oh, it's, uh, it is. Yes, you are correct. I completely forgot. I'm not using it myself, so otherwise I could do that with my Pine Cube, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I seriously have to say that I have little time in my life And no interest in running, setting up and running Home Assistant because I <laughs> do, as of now, have no use for it, sadly. And mm. I really can't deal with stuff like that. So <clears throat> uh, I'm sure eventually someone is going to document mm -hmm. that process of hooking up to Home Assistant. I'll see if I can't. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm interested enough to give it a shot. Great. <laughs> Sounds like future homework. <laughs> yeah, it sure does, oh, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe we weren't we weren't <laughs> so clever. Maybe not. Well, now let's go on to the listener questions, and we've got two new questions. One is rather simple to answer, I think, for us, and that it was asked by Frater Michal at Monstraconis on Twitter. Any information on KDE slash GS Connect for PinePhone distributions? Now, GS Connect doesn't really exist as far as I know because Fosh is quite different from stock GNOME and thus I think it can't easily run any GNOME extensions. For all I know. Mm. You could, of course, totally run GNOME 40 e.g. on Postmarket <laughs> or Fedora on your Pine phone and then install GS Connect and yeah, Bob's your uncle. But that might not be the perfect UI. Although I think it's when I tried it briefly, it was better than I would have expected. So mm -hmm. uh, if you want to give that a try, um, dear Pine phone users out there listening to this, a uh, good option to do so is Maggie's new multi-boot image, which actually comes with a GNOME option. I think it's post-market or GNOME that you can just boot into mm -hmm. and try this. Now, KDE Connect exists and it has a nice Kirigam UI. It comes pre-installed on most Plasma Mobile distributions, for example, Mandrao Plasma Mobile. And if it isn't pre-installed, it can be installed. It can also be installed, of course, on distributions running Fosh. There have been some complications with KD Connect taking over stuff like phone calls. So people wanted to call some friends from the contacts app and then <laughs> KD Connect would interject and take over. I, I personally <laughs> not run into those, fortunately. Uh, but I recall hearing of such an issue on Mobian, but I'm sure that there are workarounds and uh, by now, but 
If not, well, man, tough luck. You've got a choice. You can either <laughs> sync your stuff easily and uh, share files easily and stuff, or have phone calls from your contacts app, right? Um, you got to make a choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite But the dilemma. <laughs> anyway, long story short, it's a thing. It exists, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we had another question on Mastodon. And Petrus Citrus or Petrus Citrus at Mastodon.social asked, Question to the both of you at TalkPine. What is a project you want to see on the PinePhone that can be realistically done by a beginner programmer who's looking to get their hands dirty and expand their skill set? Be it practical, cool, or just plain fun, throw us some ideas. Now, we discussed this, Ezra, right, when we were preparing, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, God, what? Am, what? my only answer is like, well, you know, um, just play around with the Pine phone, maybe check this app list that I created mm -hmm. and maintain, uh, and <laughs> if you find something that you're missing, you know, scratch that itch and do it with the toolkit and stuff that you're most familiar yeah. with. But yeah, that... Yeah would have been a quite unsatisfactory answer. So we crowdsourced the question a bit on Discord, Twitter, and most successfully, Fosterdon. And we came up with the following. Now, I'm not going to name the person that suggested these things, except in one case, but I'm, we're going to link all these individual toots as far as possible in the show notes. So one suggestion was a Roku remote. No, a Roku is one of these media playback devices that you connect to your TV or that is built into your smart TV. And yeah, we found some pre-existing code for that. So maybe Roku GTK, which is on the Snap Store, is the most promising option, but there's also a Bluetooth library Uh, and more. So that looks like it might be doable. Regarding Roku GTK, the last commit happened in March 2018. I think it's still Python 2, and I tried to run it briefly, but didn't get it to work in the couple of minutes I spent on it. So there's some modernizing to be done, but that might be something to look at. And if you're interested in that, Pytris, Citrus, then why not? That sounds like a task that could be doable for beginners. Yeah. The next cloud client? Yeah, next cloud client. I think that's something that would be like changing the existing next cloud client app. Yeah. Which can be coerced to work, you know? But it's definitely not mobile friendly. Yeah. So without scale to fit or, you know, convergence, a connected mm -hmm. larger screen, uh, you can't really set up Nextcloud currently. Mm -hmm. Once it's set up, it runs well and syncs the data. But before that, this uh, Nextcloud client that Nextcloud makes uh, is definitely not really very good yet. So it would be quite a interestingly simple project considering that all you'd have to do is is change uh, uh i guess the visuals yeah. change the visuals but then i think the part that doesn't really scale well might be cute widget mm. and not cute quick mm -hmm. or kirigami or something so it's certainly a project there's also uh another suggestion to port Gadget Bridge to Linux, which is <laughs> okay. a good idea, but maybe a bit much. <laughs> also, we are, we already have Siglo and Amazefish, uh, which maybe could be extended to offer more and thus become closer to Gadget Bridge in terms of functionality. But otherwise, and even then, it's quite the project. Uh, extending the other ones, as Ezra said, would be the easier option. Mm -hmm, definitely. Most likely. Good. So then Martin Brahm 
uh, answered this uh, our call for help <laughs> <laughs> on this question. He had four suggestions. Uh, so apps he apparently did not write himself yet. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a Wi-Fi analyzer replacement. Now, Wi-Fi analyzer, I found an Android app that of that name, and I recall using it. So that's uh, an app that helps you picking the right channel for your Wi-Fi network by analyzing the networks around you. And yeah, that's something that's definitely helpful. Um, although I would bet that there are some uh, nifty, maybe, and curses UI terminal apps for that. Mm -hmm. And I also know that Ubuntu Touch has Wi-Fi scanner. Um, but yeah, um, Wi-Fi scanner, I don't know whether it's been run on other distributions than, than Ubuntu Touch. And why not? I mean, that's definitely a nice, would be a nice app to have. and also relatively easy i think but then i'm not really didn't really think too hard about this as well you as a programmer what do you think is visualizing wi-fi net nearby wi-fi networks uh easy well, or not you definitely no need to know at least two things which is going to be or at least one thing which is going to be like the visualization itself you're going to want to know like graphics programming a little bit yeah i think if uh, uh but um I, i've never like actually analyzed wi-fi <laughs> before but yeah it, it couldn't be too hard i would say it would definitely it, it's a it's a two part project right you need to learn how to make the, an, yeah. the uh, visuals and you need to know how to get the data which actually does sound like quite uh, a promising project someone could pull off as their first project because it's it it allows you to think of that simple in and out you know what does the visualizer take in this data and what does it draw as an output What does the Wi-Fi, you're going to probably find a library that can scan through the libraries or through the yeah. Wi-Fi or something. What does that, what can you scan from that? And what data can you push to the visualizer? So, yeah, yeah I would definitely say that, uh, like you said, um, that there there might be already some nifty end curses apps for that. So you can also inspire from other projects. Yeah, or that you want to touch app, right? Yeah, That's yeah. open source too, so... I mean, if you're, if you want to, you can just try uh, to see uh, how to package that up. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it'd be easy. It'd how be to easy. get it running? Just write instructions, and everybody's going to be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's because it should be doable. It's just a bit hard, and you need to figure things out. Oh, actually. Yeah. Oh, it seems easy enough because you, you just need to, depending on what data you get from, like. Your Wi-Fi, that's the bit that I'm a bit don't know. But it's, yeah. it's really like drawing any kind of like graphs. Yeah, exactly. You're, 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 you're drawing a graph. So it, you couldn't have a simpler graphic thing to program, you know? Yeah. That, that is like level one graphics programming. So. You who you found something the big for loop uh for or no well it all depends I don't know you, you there's many <laughs> ways you can program it I was just gonna do a big for yeah. loop and have like I don't know what do I detect in this bandwidth what do I detect in that bandwidth well, I don't know what information you get from Wi-Fi I don't know if it just yeah. gives you everything and you're like oh just place the data there easy done finished any other suggestions Martin Ram has for us. <laughs> Yeah, the next one uh, might be up your alley because it's a game. Mm -hmm. And that's a good cookie clicker replacement. I didn't actually know what that was. That's why I asked him. Because I first thought it was something like one of these, there are these browser plugins that uh, solve those stupid cookie banners you get on so many websites mm -hmm. that always, uh, of course, um, want your full trust and 
value your privacy. <laughs> <laughs> we value your privacy. Uh, Please accept cookies. It's not that. It's something that you apparently, I think, madly type upon and then uh, it's something with cookies. It's capitalism uh, uh, visualized in a cookie. Oh my god. First you need to do the hard labor of clicking a cookie. Every time you click it, you get a cookie. <laughs> And once you have a certain amount of cookies, you can spend those cookies to buy up upgrades of sorts. For instance, a cursor that can click the cookie for you. Ah, okay. And that allows you to make more cookie cookies in less time, which allows you to buy more things quicker, which then allow you to increase the number of cookies you make per second. And the game is an endless cycle <laughs> of just finding more and more ways to get more and more cookies in less and less time. It's only about production distribution is a given. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, okay. I, 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 I suppose it's in your own wealth. It's pretty much a money-making machine because you're buying the things with cookies, right? So the cookies is economy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds like a fun thing and also beginner-friendly. Oh, yeah. I, 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 Logic doesn't seem too hard. No, no. I feel like I might just do that like this weekend. <laughs> no, as well, you first need to finish your right game. You're right. The other one. And then you can pick that as your next project because you want a project that you're done with faster. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Then uh, he also suggests a pushover client. So pushover is some kind of notification think th mm -hmm. thinking service um which i've personally never used so i don't really know much about that but okay i guess they've got an api mm -hmm. so but then the linux desktop notifications also have apis so that should be doable i guess yeah i would suppose so it all depends but i would suppose so yeah and bluetooth le browser so Bluetooth LE browsing is something that apps like Siglo already do, but they only show you that one device, the Pine Time. So uh -huh. that's also, um, well, definitely something that's needed. Mm -hmm. Useful because I've got some Bluetooth LE hardware here that I would like to play with. And I'm not aware of any uh, mobile friendly Linux graphical user interface while well, stuff like that totally exists on android i think there is even more than one on the android store alone so that's something that would be great too mm -hmm. we also received some more general suggestions like uh, perhaps adding functionality to an existing application might be a good way to start and yeah definitely agreed right mm -hmm. I mean, I could interject quickly that you can, yeah. adding functionality is one thing. You could also fix a bug. That is a very easy, simple way yeah. that, that does help people because, you know. Oh, definitely. There's there so many bugs here and there. And I mean, even, even if they're easy. Bugs, help. Help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Often the bug that you encounter isn't even, hasn't even been reported yet. Yeah. There you go. It's a little problem. Oh, but you know? then. Like a puzzle game. Maybe. You can report it and suggest a fix at the same time. Yeah. That would be really awesome. Ooh. Isn't that great? So I think that would be my modified version of what that, that suggestion is. Totally. And then there's one more thing we got, and that is a suggestion to use LVGL, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think, MIT licensed. Really lightweight toolkit that's also used on the Pine Time. Uh, that could be used for a fast graphical user interface. So if you're bored of using Qt or GTK, that would be an interesting project. And it's definitely been run on the Pine Phone before. I recall that uh, uh, Loop Yun Li, uh, I hope I'm totally butchering that name, I guess. You know, that guy who's been playing with the Pine Phone, with the Pine Time. And with the pine cone, pine nut, uh -huh. and pine dio, um, uh, I think he's a lecturer or professor in Singapore. Uh, he's been playing with that toolkit 
on Ubuntu Touch, if I recall correctly. So, yep, that would be a nice option for a fast and lightweight graphical user interface. So, if you want to be special and not use the boring stuff everybody else does, why not try LVGL? You have me sold. <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I uh, will also uh, link that blog post I was just referring to. Mm. Um, so that that's easier then. And also link the ideas. And I will try to link all these, um, well, proprietary apps that have been suggested, like pushover clients or what is pushover. I'll link that. I will link good cookie clicker and so on mm -hmm. so there's tons to do for me to finish this uh, but um, there's also tons to do of course uh, for the pine phone mm -hmm. and the, the software landscape of the pine phone and there's definitely more that hasn't been mentioned here but I think this is enough to maybe start I hope you are happy with this answer I think it was good anyway. Definitely. And with this, we are coming to an end, slowly but surely. So if you are subscribed to our MP3 feed, check out the chapter markers. These can be handy if you vaguely remember something we may have talked about and want to find it again. Or if you find a segment really boring and want to skip it. If you don't need these chapter markers, save some bandwidth and use Peter's beloved Opus version. Once more, a huge thanks to Nerd Zoom Media for being our awesome audio producers. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so please leave feedback on what we should do better Get your suggestions in and feel free to ask questions. We are really close to running out of questions, as always. Um, we always have a small bucket, but answering them is basically a full episode on their own. Um, so if you have little things you'd like to know about or just want our opinion on, please do. Questions like, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? These are the simple questions in life. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> if you want to discuss these questions, you can also join our Discord channel, Pine Talk Podcast, on Pine64's Discord, or you can send us an email at pinetalk at pine64.org, or tweet at us, we're at TalkPine. We've also joined Mastodon a while ago, we're at TalkPine at Fosteron.org. If you can't remember these names, just use the hashtag AskPineTalk. Also, we have a thread for feedback and questions on the Pine64 forums, which is no longer new, but still way too empty. <laughs> it's in the community section and will be linked in the show notes of this episode. We really look forward to your feedback. <laughs> And bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.